Last week we began a series of studies in the book of Proverbs. We are entitling it an owner's manual for daily living. God has given us in his word, his revelation about himself and about us. And he's given us very practical instructions on how to live. And probably the most practical book of the Bible is the Old Testament book of Proverbs. This morning we'll be in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 through 19. Gang-related violence has been a growing problem in our society, and it's not just major metropolitan areas like Chicago or East St. Louis that's feeling this increase. We're seeing it in cities in central Illinois, such as Champaign-Urbana, Decatur, Springfield, where there's been a dramatic rise in gun violence and gang activity this year. Hardly a day passes without reports of gunfire and victims of violence reported on the news. And people are getting frustrated. I don't think it's coincidence that the chief of police of Decatur and the chief of police of Champaign resigned in the same week because they are feeling more and more helpless to stem the tide. Communities are at a loss to know what to do. They're trying. They're trying to come together. They're pleading with people to put down their guns. But it's not happening. All the millions of dollars that are being spent aren't making a difference. Now while this is daunting, the problem of gangs and gang-related crime is nothing new. Believe it or not, it goes all the way back to the times of the Bible. And I believe the Bible speaks about this problem and what can be done about it. So I turn your attention this morning to Proverbs chapter 1. In words that were written thousands of years ago, we're going to find the building blocks of this very real, very relevant problem. And I believe some steps that can be taken to counteract or even prevent it from happening. So in Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 8, Solomon first points out the worth of of parental teaching. He says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. They will be a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. You see, it all begins at home. Throughout our country, homeschooling has become a popular option for parents who maybe don't want to send their children to public schools, but maybe they can't afford private schools. This last year with COVID, everybody was homeschooling. There wasn't much of a choice. But this kind of homeschooling the Bible talks about doesn't happen in certain hours or in a desk with textbooks and assignments. This is more of a lifestyle. And I want you to notice that both father and mother are involved in this instruction. It doesn't just all fall to mom. It doesn't all fall to dad. I believe both need to be involved in our young people's lives as they give them education for life. Now, the book of, Pro or the book of Proverbs simply echoes what Moses had written long ago in Deuteronomy 6, a passage that was read for us earlier. I'd just like to pick up verse 4 of that passage. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. 
Tie them as symbols of your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Then in that same chapter, down in verse 20, in the future when your son asks, what is the meaning of all the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible, upon Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us up out of there and to bring us in and give us the land that he has promised on oath to our forefathers. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God as he commanded us, that will be our righteousness. Talk about homeschooling. That's what Moses is talking about here. And it doesn't happen from Monday to Friday between a certain time and another time. It's throughout our lives. It happens at all kinds of times in a variety of settings. Notice he says there, while you're walking down the road, when you're sitting down, when you lie down, when you get up, all throughout your day, you could be driving in the car, you could be at the dinner table. You could be outside working on the yard or around the house. All these ordinary situations become opportunities to invest into our children. And when children ask their favorite question, which is, why? These are also opportunities to invest into them to instill into them the truth, the values of God and His Word. And that should be first and foremost in our curriculum. Nothing is more important to our children's lives than knowing who God is, having that right relationship with Jesus Christ. And that needs to start at an early age. I know that it's very trendy today to say, well, we'll just let our kids grow up and they can decide for themselves. It is true. They will decide for themselves. But if we do not teach them the truth of God and His Word, who will? They're not going to get it at school. They're not going to get it on television. They're not going to get it on the Internet. If they don't hear about God and His Word from us, it's not even going to be an option for them when they get older. They aren't going to know about it. And trust me, we have a generation or two of biblical illiterates in our culture today. They have no clue what the Bible has to say. You even see it sometimes on game shows, on television. You know, Jeopardy will have a, a category of the Bible you have silence in 37 languages. They just sit there and look. I saw a different game show the other day, and, and the question was, this character in the Bible spent three days in the belly of a whale, and people looked at each other like, huh? They don't have a clue. Why? Because they're not being taught. And where does it need to be taught? It needs to be taught at home. Don't wait for the school to do it, because it's not going to happen. Don't even wait for the church to do it because you're only there an hour a week. It begins at home. And it is an awesome responsibility that we have. But it's not just about God and His Word. What Solomon is talking about here is wisdom for life. Teaching them how to make good choices. And specifically in this text, he's talking about the choices we make regarding our companions, our friends. Those who have a lot of, of influence in our lives. And we have in God's Word, divinely inspired, practical wisdom 
And it's a good textbook for life, which parents can use to teach their children. Now, we can't teach what we're not doing ourselves. We need to be faithful in learning about God through the scriptures ourselves so that we can pass that along to our children. And don't expect somebody else to do it. It's good to bring your children to church and to have them go to Sunday school. But if they're not hearing it back up at home, it's not going to stick. It's not going to take root. Mom and Dad, we need to take the lead. Grandparents, you often have an opportunity with your grandchildren to instill the truth of God's Word. Paul writes in Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And I can't think of too much more exasperating for children than when a parent tries to teach them something they aren't practicing themselves. We've got to be living it. And we need to be teaching it. Now on the other side of the equation, children have a responsibility to listen to their parents. I say, ah, you don't know my mom and dad. They have no room to tell me anything. And the Bible doesn't make the qualification here. It doesn't say children obey your parents if they're cool. Children obey your parents if they're always right. Children obey your parents if you approve of what they're doing and saying. He just says, obey your parents, for this is right. And that's where it begins. Mark Twain, in his uh, traditional candor, admitted that when I was a boy of 14, my father was a complete idiot. He didn't know anything. It was amazing when I got to 21 how much the old man had learned in seven years. <laughs> I don't know that it was his dad that learned so much. I think it was he himself. And as children get older, they do come to respect and, and, and appreciate what their parents are trying to do. But this is a, a standard, this is a, a principle that is being lost in our world and we're seeing the results all around us. We're reaping a harvest. Children need to be taught how to relate to authority. And that starts at home. The very first authority figures they have are mom and dad. And if they are not taught how to relate properly to mom and dad's authority, what's going to happen when they go to school? And they have a teacher. What happens when they go and get a job and they have a boss? What happens in their life in the community where there are police who enforce the law? All figures of authority. And what we're seeing today is generations brought up that have no clue how to relate to authority. Parents are so interested in being their best friends, and I'm afraid they might not like me, so I'm not going to make them do anything. I'm not going to tell them what's right and wrong. I'm not going to enforce the rules. And what we end up having is an entire generation that can't learn, can't work, and more often than not, don't care about the law. And most tragically, they can't relate to God's authority either. Who's God to tell me what I can and cannot do? Well, he's the one that made you. And he's the one to whom ultimately you will give an account. But they don't have a clue because we're not teaching them that there are people that are in authority over you and you have a responsibility to listen and to do what they say. Again, that begins at home. Don't expect the schools to discipline your children. They're not going to. Don't expect them to learn that when they get out of the workforce. It's too late by then. And what we keep seeing over and over happening in our communities, and it's not even just the bigger cities that this is happening. We're seeing violence and crime even in small rural communities. And you see parents and you see grandparents that say, I can't believe my kid's doing this. Now, I'm not saying that 
it's always a result of parental failure because there are times when parents do exactly the right thing. Kids make choices of their own. They have that capability. Adam and Eve chose on their own in the Garden of Eden. It's not because God failed. So I'm not trying to equate the two. What I'm saying is where there is no parental training, where there is no parental interaction in the life of children, what do we expect will be the result? And the fact of the matter is, in our culture today, we are seeing an absence of parental influence, particularly from fathers. There are way too many children growing up today without a male influence in their lives. And we are reaping the harvest. Don't blame it on the schools. Don't blame it on the government. Don't blame it on the media. Let's put the responsibility back where it belongs, and that's in the home. And that's something that God has been saying in His Word all along. In Proverbs 19.20, it says, Listen to advice and accept instruction, and in the end you will be wise. But that doesn't come naturally. That's something we need to instill in our children. Why? Solomon moves on from the worth of parental teaching to the whisper of peer temptation in verses 10 through 14. My son, if sinners entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let us lie and wait for someone's blood. Let's waylay some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit. We'll get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot with us and we will share a common purse. Without question, the two most influential groups in a child's life is their parents and their peers. And if there is an absence of parental teaching, the pool of peer temptation is almost irresistible. Now, you hear those verses, and it sounds an awful, like, an awful lot like they're going to get rich by exploiting others. You're, you see hints here of armed robbery and even murder, which is happening in our communities. When you examine these murders that are taking place, this gun violence, even gang activity. It's often around stealing and murder. This was a problem all the way back in the time of Solomon. Gangs of youth coming together to do these things. And you, we see it today in the selling of drugs and human trafficking, intimidation and extortion, all with the threat, if not the reality of violence. You know, the heart of this temptation has more to do with the, ex the excitement, the sense of power that goes along with these activities and being accepted as one of the gang. If our children are not feeling accepted at home, if they do not sense an identity from their family, they're going to find it somewhere else. And there are plenty of places out there that are saying, come, come with us. Find your identity here. You don't have a family at home, we'll be your family. And they have a sense of belonging, a sense of identity. Scriptures are filled with warnings about the danger of going the way of the crowd. Psalm 1 1 says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 33, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. As Warren Wiersbe puts it, if you're walking with the wrong crowd, you'll end up doing the wrong things. And unfortunately, thousands of individuals, many young people, have ruined their lives because they did not choose their friends wisely. 
And as adults, they may end up with a police record. They may have the physical and mental effects of illegal drugs if they survive to adulthood. Yeah, but everybody does it. That's what our young people say, right? Haven't we all heard that as parents? Everybody's doing it. And our answer is always the same. If everybody was jumping off a bridge with you, oh, come on. You, you've said that, haven't you? Or something like that. Yeah. But that pull is very strong. But something we need to teach our children is that morality is never subjected to a democratic vote. It doesn't matter if everybody else is doing it. If it's wrong, it's still wrong. You look through the scripture and how many times the majority was dead wrong. You know, it's the spies that were sent into Canaan. Ten of the twelve came back saying we can't do it. Eighty-three percent. They must be right. No, they weren't. They were dead wrong. You had the nation of Israel who was insisting against God's advice. We want a king. We want a king. Everybody else has a king. We want a king. God says, you don't want a king. They're going to tax you to death. They're going to take your sons and daughters into the service of the country. and You don't want that. Oh yeah, we want a king. Everybody has a king. So God said, okay, I'll give you a king. They didn't like it. Then you had the overwhelming vote of the Sanhedrin on the guilt of Jesus, condemning him to death. It was unanimous. But that did not mean he was guilty. It did not mean that he deserved to die. Frankly, if we're serious about what God says in our fallen human nature, it's doubtful the majority is ever right. And anybody who makes it easy for us to disobey God is certainly not a friend. No principle of child rearing may be more vital and yet more neglected than this one. Teach your children how to choose their companions wisely. In Proverbs 13, 20, Solomon writes, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. And as parents, we must be intentional. We must go on the offensive here. We must take that first step. If we do not teach our children how to select and help them learn to select for themselves the right kind of companions, the wrong kind of companions will inevitably select them. This is a fundamental part of successful biblical parenting. Your kids' personal moral standards, the language they use, the activities they're going to engage in will probably not rise above the companions they keep. Rarely does a child have the capability to elevate himself above that group they run around with. Now, don't expect your children to understand that at the time. They don't see it. They don't have the wisdom and the experience that you do. That's why we can't let our kids do everything on their own. Now, I believe that as a child gets older, you allow them to make some choices for themselves. That's necessary. But it's something this vital. Don't stand by in silence. Don't be like Adam who let the serpent tempt Eve to eat the forbidden fruit and didn't say a word. You read the scripture, Adam was right there and he didn't say one word. Parents, don't make the same mistake. We need to speak up, we need to speak out, and we need to teach our children. And one of the fundamental areas is the kind of people that they are choosing to run with. Later on, they'll appreciate your influence, even if they don't right now. But remember, parenting is not a popularity contest. We gotta do what's right. Not necessarily what's popular. Chuck Swindoll comments, The longer I live, the more careful I am with my choice of friends. I have fewer friends than in my 
youthful years, but they're deeper friends, treasured relationships. As we read in Solomon's Council, do not consent to relationships that drag you down and hurt your walk with God. Those who ambush their own lives will get you involved in counterproductive activities that will keep wisdom at an arm's distance. You don't need that. And he speaks from years of experience, something our children don't have. But we do. And we are obligated to share that experience to mold and shape these young lives. Now Solomon concludes with a warning of promised trouble, verses 15 through 19. He says, My son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths. For their feet rush into sin, they are swift to shed blood. How useless to spread a net in full view of all the birds. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They waylay only themselves. Such is the end of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the lives of those who get it. See, there's a moral to the story. Those who try to get rich at the expense of others pay with their own lives. Paul warns in 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 9, people who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some, money, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with all kinds of griefs. The Bible clearly teaches that when we harm others, we're only harming ourselves. We're free to take what we want from life, but eventually we'll have to pay for it. And the price we pay is often higher than the value we gain. We end up sacrificing the permanent for the immediate. And that's a bad investment. And we're not just talking about monetary or material possessions. Any kind of sin has a way of coming back to bite us. Numbers 32, 23 says, you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Oh, you think you get away with it for a while. It'll come around. Galatians 6, 7 warns, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Proverbs 29, 6 says, an evil man is snared by his own sin, but a righteous one can sing and be glad. And whenever I think of that concept, I always think of the cartoon character Wiley Coyote. Remember him? He's always after the roadrunner. <laughs> You know, this is before Amazon Prime. They had acne. <laughs> and he would always get these contraptions, and he'd have the most elaborate schemes to catch the roadrunner. And it always came back on him, didn't it? Yeah. And that's true in life as well. To the young people hearing this message, I urge you to listen to the wisdom from these verses of Scripture. You have a great opportunity to discover the truth now so that you don't have to make serious, even life-changing mistakes. I've, I'm sure you've heard of people who live and learn from their mistakes, but unfortunately by then the damage is done, and sometimes that damage is irreversible. How much better it is to learn and live, avoiding the high cost of tuition in the school of unwise experience. Listen to your parents and your grandparents. Learn from their mistakes. Don't insist on making them for yourself. And at the top of the list of lessons to be learned, be careful whom you allow to influence your life. You might think you have it all under control, but the fact is you are influenced by those you hang around with. It's unavoidable, so be careful who you allow into your life. Parents, Grandparents, we need to take this responsibility seriously. Even if we don't have, we don't live in communities where gangs are actively recruiting our young people, be certain that eventually our kids are going to face tremendous peer pressure to conform to a standard of conduct that is ungodly and sinful. We need to teach them to choose their companions wisely. We need to know who they're chatting with. We need to know who they're hanging out with when they're young. We need to make those lessons very clear that they make good choices. Instruct them how to choose companions that will lift them up, not those who will bring them down. 
Let's not allow our generation to become mere statistics. We have a responsibility to do. We ought to be at the forefront in fulfilling that.